Welcome to Blue Collar Mystics, the under the hood approach to the depths of human consciousness. So many mysteries, so little time, so many big words. That's why we aim to take the mystical and make it practical, usable in your everyday life. And you know, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your story. What happened when you started asking yourself the real questions? Like, who am I? What is this? Is it a hologram? Is this some kind of weird cosmic joke? Hey, these are the questions that we are trying to get to the bottom of as we explore the final rabbit hole together here as Blue Collar Mystics. What's up, everybody? How's it going? We are live here on YouTube. We're live on Rockfin. Got a couple on Rockfin. Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? We're also live in the Facebook group. Hope everybody's doing well. This is uh, the Blue Collar Mystics Transurfing Safari Edition with a great Abby Johnson. Welcome, Abby. Well, thank you for calling me great. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you are great. I am. Um... <laughs> Yeah. How are you? You're great too. Thank you very much. Everybody in the chat, you're great. Of course, there's nobody in there, but you know, you would be great. <laughs> but that's all right. You we'll, would be great. <laughs> we'll get some people uh hopping on and hanging out. We have been talking about the reality transserving book, which I have a copy of right here. Uh reality transurfing. It's the thick one. I made a summary of it. If that's something that might be helpful to you, my friend Isaac. Today told me that he just finished it and he had some good feedback for me. Most all very positive. He said that I could uh, I could ex expound on the turning the key exercise. That was his uh, only critique. So I'll make a video about it. And well, uh, turning the key is the cool thing. Like that. The yeah, it is cool. It is very cool. It's very yeah. awesome. I think it'd be something that that will help to have a visual too as well. So, um, so yeah, so that's available. Please check that out. I just got back from going on tour and doing some comedy. It was really fun. Uh, so we took last week off. Uh, but I'm glad that we're still doing these live. I think it's more fun. It so, is. Yeah. So we were not around last week. So we, we are here this week, once again, picking it back up. And we're doing chapter 13, which is coordination, which is really... I say this like every week. I'm like, this is the most important idea in the book. <laughs> <laughs> like you got it. You, you, this is a can't, this is a can't miss episode, but it's, it's just true in this case. And you know, the truth of it, it with all, all the transurfing stuff, you hear people talking about it. They don't really go this far. Usually, you know, you will get to chapter eight, nine, 10, and then that's about it. You know, you get to goals and doors and then people are like, all right, can't really teach you this other shit. <laughs> Cause it's, it's, I mean, this is the, but this is the tech, the technical part of the book, right? Like, so the theory part is really those first 10 chapters. And then now we start to really get into the, the practical, the practical use of the book. Uh, and I like the theory stuff a lot. I think it's fascinating, but I think it's also incredibly important to talk about the things that you can actually put into practice, how this, how this actually does work and how you can implement it into your life. Yeah, because that's why we're doing it, right? Because we want to be able to use it. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, you want to be able to use it. <laughs> Very well said. Yes. Um, and so this is really a big chapter when it comes down to that. 
uh, he's talking a lot about how to get what we want, how to get our goals to happen and how most of us go about that the wrong way. A lot of us try to feign confidence, put a front on, pretend to be, pretend to be capable, fake it till we make it, so to speak. Uh, or we're just insecure. And really those two things are more or less the, the same, same thing. The same. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. It's a spectrum and it's all false. Well, I guess it's not false because it's genuinely how you see things, but really, I mean, how much importance is put on being self-confident and all that self-confidence that you hear about it all the time and all the psychology books, you know, if you, I mean, it's everywhere. It's like, it's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be confident, right? Yeah. But I don't know how you're supposed to earn that confidence, <clears throat> you know, from yourself. Right. And so he does talk, especially at the end of the chapter, a little bit about self-worth and how that's really what we're all more or less looking for is that self-worth and being, being allowing ourselves to have really being able to accept things into our lives. That that's, that's really the skill to, to benefit, to cultivate your experience more, uh, more, more so than money or anything else. <clears throat> and, uh, it's interesting how he talks about it in the first part of the chapter. Um, he is really just, just differentiating between inner intention and he's talking about inner intention and confidence versus outer intention being really this magical coordinated state, right? Where it's like we go in through the chapter and really starting to more and more understand <laughs> what are you, are you taking photos? I'm going to put it on Instagram. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> and under, understand, you know, the, the ideas of, of outer intention a little bit, a little bit better. And then the idea of inner intention really being from this, like maybe machismo confident place uh, or fake confident place, uh, trying to push, push the world around. Whereas outer intention is really about allowing those things to unfold. And so a lot of the obstacles that we're putting in our own way are there and due to importance. So he talks a little bit about reducing importance and he talks about desire and cultivating intention in this chapter. Cause I think it, like, it's easy to get it twisted. People like, Oh no, desire is bad. If I desire something that's bad, I'll, I'll block myself from having it. But it's like desire is the beginning point to begin to shape intention. So it's not a bad thing to have desire. It's a bad thing to have desire and not do anything with it. But it's a it's okay to have desire. That's the beginning. That's the beginning of intention, he says. I think it's also can be confused because like the very beginning of this chapter is prefaced with this quote, and it says, I do not want or hope, I intend. And so that seems like wanting is bad, but it's wanting, you know, the desire to have something is the beginning of intention. Because why why else would you intend it if you didn't want it, right? Um I guess you can do things intentionally from a negative standpoint, but it, people don't realize that like a pessimist is always creating what they, what they desire, <laughs> which is more negativity, you know, but. Absolutely. Yeah. And he talks about that a little bit later in the, in the chapter two, the negativist, you know, uh, yeah, absolutely. Just creating, creating, making themselves right. And being yeah. proud of it, you know, through a negative lens. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, so it still starts with desire. It's the desire to be right, you know. So desire that the world is shit, even though they don't think they want that, but that you know, secretly they kind of do. Well, yeah, I mean, I think I really think that's our prime primary need is to be right. Like if you're gonna. Yeah like boil it all down. You know what I mean? It's like, if I eat like the windowsill, you know what I mean? For sustenance, I don't survive. So for me, it's like understanding reality. And that's, that's first and foremost, you know, you gotta be right. And so we're all sort of proving ourselves right constantly 
And we, yeah, we, we covered that. That's kind of the premise of the book. Um, <clears throat> but starting to differentiate between these sort of elements, like the idea of confidence or true confidence or knowledge and faith and how intention works, you know, cause the idea of coordination is really, it's about coordinating your heart and mind and your heart, as we've spoken about, has its own kinky interests about the world. Your mind has been indoctrinated and culturally uh, sort of massaged into a certain worldview, the way that your language is, all your programming, all that kind of stuff, which is fascinating stuff to me. Um, but those two elements are, are working with each other and often against each other. So, I mean, just me realizing well, the first time I realized, oh my God, I can feel good about something and it makes logical sense. Like I didn't think that was a possibility. You know what I mean? Like I didn't realize you could do that. I was like, oh my God, I can like be aligned with some, but that's the whole idea is that we're coordinating uh, first and foremost within our own psyche because the, the biggest issues are, are coming up between our interference between the heart and mind, he says. Um, so really that's the first and most important aspect of this chapter is the coordination of heart and mind first and foremost. And he's going on yeah. to talk about coordinating other things too. Um, talking about importance <clears throat> next, um, <clears throat> when he's, when he's talking about this stuff. But back to the whole self-confidence versus, you know, inferiority complexes and all of that. Like, um, that is a matter of importance always. Like, if I feel very confident about this, I mean, you're actually leaving that up to the sway of pendulums. You know, you're not really, you don't know. You don't feel worthy necessarily. You're just saying, like, I think I can do okay. And then usually, you know, you you put importance on it. So it doesn't turn out the way that you want. The same way with feeling inferior. So really the trick is to know your self-worth and to not allow others to change that view of yourself. You know your strengths, you know your weaknesses. Your weaknesses aren't always a bad thing either, you know, um, but you know your value. And if you don't know your value, then you need to start like thinking about that Not and not enough like self-confident sort of way, not, not about building your confidence, just knowing your worth you have value. Every person to here does a hundred percent. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing to, th to keep in mind too, because we tie our self-worth a lot of times to goals, uh, attaining goals, having things, but you're not worthy because of what you do, you know, like that has literally zero to do with it. Like your heart is perfect. <clears throat> just by, by virtue of being what it is, you know? So I made a video really, I think this week when I was in Florida and it was, I don't know, there was some weird lighting stuff with the whole thing, but it, it was a, the, the meaning of the video I think was good. And that's really, it's not about what you've done. It's about who you are, you know? And that is really what should matter most when you consider your self-worth, when you think about, why you are worthy, why you do deserve, or have you have earned probably <laughs> whatever, whatever is, is coming, you know, or whatever it is that you want. Um, you know, it, it's not, it's not because you did certain things that you are deserving. It's just because you are who you are that you deserve it. Yeah. You, you know. I, I take that back to like what I learned in this NLP course is that, and that I quote it all the time because it's really a good positive outlook without being f super positive, you know, like false positivity. It's just that there is no failure, only feedback. So, you know, your failures don't, shouldn't contribute to feeling less worthy is, is feedback for you. You know, okay, X didn't work. This didn't work out for me. That's not for me. <laughs> you know, those are good things. Yeah. And mitigating guilt or, or, um, contempt or a shame or any of that, you know, type of emotions. It's like the biggest thing in this chapter, when he's talking about overcoming importance and 
turning that desire into intention is just action. It's action, 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 action. You know, that will dissipate the, uh, the tension and the uh, importance, the excess potential of you thinking and fantasizing or like over a certain thing. Just take yeah. action. It doesn't even have to be. Like, how do you get rid of anxiety? Anxiety is about fear, right? It's just fear of the future. So if you're anxious, just act, do something about it. Yeah. It's pretty, and it's, it's with all of it, you know? Yeah. And it doesn't even have yeah. to be a big action. It just needs to be some movement in some direction, you know, that will dissipate that yeah. excess potential, that desire, you know, don't react, <laughs> just act. <laughs> yeah. Be proactive. Don't be reactive. But yeah, I mean, he says that confidence yeah. is just a temporary excess potential. That's all confidence is. So it, it ultimately swing that swings back like a pendulum. If you're confident, you want to have knowledge though. You want to have knowledge in the system. You want to understand that if you coordinate things properly, if you can align your heart and mind, and if you can learn how to notice and read signs and see the flow of alternatives, then you can use outer intention and notice when things and opportunities open up for you and, and be, um, just be aware and be able to take advantage of the opportunity when it presents itself to you. Whereas otherwise you might not without the system and without the ability to coordinate. <clears throat> so we're taking a lot of these elements and sort of putting them together uh, with this idea of coordination. And that's really what coordination is. It's a, it's, it's definitely a um, way to think about the game itself without this ego trip where you're like, I did this thing. It's like, no, you're just coordinating. You're just, you're just balancing the dishes. You know, you're just reading this sign and going over here, you know, and taking this next step you're just paddling this way a little bit you know it's not so i really like how he he describes like um insecurity and all that as a labyrinth mm -hmm. and it's like it's just a labyrinth you're stuck in and you know you can't you can't fight your way out of it <laughs> that's the big thing is that you know finding your way finding your way out of it is like it's just inviting balancing forces because you're putting a lot of importance on it. So he says that the way to get yourself out of it is just to stop struggling and then the walls crumble. And the labyrinth got me though, because this, this is how I know he's a dream hacker <laughs> because the dream hackers talk about labyrinths too in dream space. So I think that is pretty fascinating. So yeah. that's the trick to the labyrinths of the dream space too. You know, the places that you go and you can never find the way out. Stop looking. In a dream. Yeah. The walls will crumble. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, the... Um... Yeah, that's... Yeah, you, you, I love how you're... Uh, you love that connection. I love that connection too. I'm sure he probably was part of this group of dream hackers. And, you know, there is one whose name sounds very much like Vadim Zulu. I, I forget what it is exactly, but it's very similar. So I know it. <laughs> she knows it. Yeah. I'm a no. fan girl. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. Well, fair enough. I, I, me too. Yeah. <clears throat> no, it's, it's awesome that it's that simple too. You know, I love the, I love the way he describes it as a labyrinth. Cause it's like the more that you, look and look and look and try to find a way out and you try and improve your self-worth. It's like, you can't really do that. You can by accomplishing things and you can increase your faith in the system and your confidence in the, uh, in coordination. He's talking a little bit about that later on as well. And really what faith is. So understanding 
these elements that we've been talking about over all these episodes and being able to kind of put them together with this. It's really about seeing the whole process, watching it unfold, seeing your reality shift or your goal accomplished or however you want to think of it, that reality, you know, manifested or brought into this uh, material space and the elements that are being used in order to make that happen, you start to build a, re a relationship to the model, to the system. You start to see the results and you start to not just believe in something. You're not just putting faith in something. You actually know it. And then you start to see it actually happen for you. And so now at that point, faith is no longer required. He's talking about how Jesus, when he walked across water, it would have been like concrete. It would have just been effortless. It wouldn't have felt like he was doing anything at all. It would have felt ordinary, not even like a big deal. And that's kind of what we're talking about going from this process of desire to actuality, because in desire, you can't believe, you know, it's like such a big deal. You can't believe it yet. You know, you kind of, you have this desire for it and it's overwhelming but it's exciting. It's tantalizing. And then you get into the point where you allow yourself to have that through taking enough action. And then you get a creating sense of delight too. Yeah. Creating slides. Absolutely. And then you feel that sense of delight from knowing that it's possible from believing it, you know, and then ultimately ordinariness sets in and the thing becomes just normal, just natural. It's your new level. Yeah. You leveled up. <laughs> you, yeah. You elevated your neutral. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I like wrote that in here. You, your balance point went up. What I thought was interesting is he talks in here about, he does get quite biblical in this chapter because he goes straight into the Ten Commandments and he says, you know, the first, like basically all Ten Commandments could be boiled down to two. Um, the first two really so the first one is um thou shall have no other god before me and he said because people went and were making their own gods he said they're worshiping pendulums and it's like you don't think about it as worship but when you're a fanatic you're a fan of something or um all these religions branch off into different like sex and stuff they become they create their own version of god they're creating their own gods and that is a pendulum like so I was like, oh, wow, you know, that's that's interesting way to take it. And then the second commandment, which why is that like eluding me right now? But, is that love your neighbor as you love yourself? Is that the second commandment? No, because that's no, because Jesus said that's the that's the second commandment. We're like, so he goes into what Jesus says, though, about it all, because basically, um, oh, you shouldn't create any graven images or, you know, so you shouldn't create your own little gods and stuff. And again, that's talking about pendulums, something that you worship, something that you put all your energy into. And so he said that, that they can all be boiled down to pretty much pendulum worship, you know, pendulum, like putting, creating pendulums that are, you know, greater than God and your oneness with God, you forget that you are God. And, so Jesus said that the two greater commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your with all your mind. And that's that's just remembering who God actually is, not like every other version of God, not the pendulums, right? And then you should love your neighbor as yourself. So those are the two things that like you need to focus on. And that's where I, this this whole material was able to. I was able to accept it as a Christian, like, because he didn't, he was able to reconcile my faith in God and religion at the time to, to really his, all his concepts. <clears throat> yeah. It's not, it doesn't step on any toes as far as that goes. It really just is outlining the process that we see happen. It's a very natural process, you know? And it's cool to see how they, these elements of the former chapters weave together in this. Um, 
but I've been thinking a lot about love specifically, unconditional love too, just in regards to, I don't know, all this. I mean, it's. He defines it better than anyone, I think. You know, like I've never heard it, def like what love is defined better than by Vadim Zeeland. <laughs> I will say that. It's a perfect sacrifice of the self. It just doesn't cons even consider itself. It's just completely yeah. sacrificial of that, which is, I mean, that show me a better example in the Jesus story. You yeah. Know, the, the, what is what is more sacrificial? But I don't know. Sometimes I'm thinking maybe if he could had it all to do over again, he might be like, ah, maybe this isn't such a good idea. <laughs> you know, like look at us now. <clears throat> no, but uh now nah, he'd do it over again. I, th so I think he would do guy it he was over and over <laughs> and over again. And I think that's that's the whole point is it's not it's not even just a one time deal, right? It's it's a consistent giving. That's what unconditional love really, really yeah. is. Yeah, I've been watching this one guy's channel, uh, and he put out one. It was called Love Like the Sun. And he's just talking about like the sun never gets any real praise. We can't really even directly connect to it or anything, but it's just there giving us life every single day, humbly, gratefully, doesn't ask for anything. Mm, nice suntan. Just, yeah, exactly. It just gives and never asks. Yeah. You can also burn your ass, though. <laughs> Don't forget that. Yeah, it's true. But he gives some tips for reducing importance to obviously importance is coming from. It's, it can come from a lot of places, but that those are excess potentials. Really, it's emotional. A lot of times it's guilt, guilt or inadequacy or confidence, like any uh, anything that's really generated that's outside of of st stasis outside of zero. Um, and those, uh, those have to be quelled. But one of the things that he talks about in this chapter too is, and he reminds us to sometimes it's okay to make a mistake and blow off some steam and to, um, to, to have excess potential to allow yourself. He's, you know, talking a little bit about how we let yourself be provoked want to try to yeah we want to try to control everything we want to even try to control the fact that we're we're controlling importance <laughs> you know that's even its own trap <laughs> so really yeah easy. because then you make that important you gotta you gotta think of it on that level I can't, if you're I can't, sitting yeah. there trying to control importance so <laughs> harshly you're making it important so you're by definition just fucking yourself Exactly. And it's like, you got to think about just from a practical place, your locus of control anyway. Right. And he, later on, he's going to talk a lot about like how our mind wants to try and wrap its head around how these things are going to happen. It just gives it security. It's like, you can't, you can't wrap your head around all the, all these elements, all these variables. You know, we know that well, we've talked about that extensively, you know, um, and that's, Really, what it's about There's is just focusing. Variables. Focus on what you can do. There are infinite variables. Take an action, any action, toward your goal. One step to the letterbox, as he says. So that's really what it's about. It doesn't matter how. And I'd say another thing too that I just want to remind people that, he, and this is something that he talks about in this book, in this chapter, particularly about understanding coordination and implementing these ideas is that it's in that process of like desire, how it ultimately becomes intention, like the, the skills and abilities eventually culminate and, and we can use them, but it is a learning process. And it's not, <laughs> it's not always something that you just get right the first time off the bat. And you're like, why can't I just magically do this? It's like, well, you gotta, you gotta, you're working with several different variables all at the same time and you got to give yourself some space some time to to play and to be a little bit of a scientist and to put this stuff into action and then your mind once you can see he, he, actually the 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 example that he uses is riding a bicycle without training wheels 
or they call them stabilizers, I guess, in the UK or whatever, however it was translated. But it's like the first time you ride without training wheels, you know you're going to fall, dude. You just are. You're going to fall. And it's like, that's okay. You know, <laughs> like eventually the bike will stay up and your mind doesn't know how the bike stays up. It doesn't have like a, con you know, a conscious example or understanding of why you can balance the bike it just sees that the ba ba bike can it. be balanced yeah. and now you not you don't believe you don't have faith you know right you know yeah. at that point <clears throat> so that definitely beats the fuck Period. out of confidence right like confidence is just a generated bravado it's just an attitude for a minute and it's fun it's a fun thing to play it's very funny Confidence is very funny. Cockiness, arrogance, very funny. But it's really not enough. It's not enough to fill up a sail of intention, as he says, right? And insecurity is obviously not going to help you. So you try and put that bravado idea on. You can take all your insecurities and just project them into confidence. But that's not enough to actually get the wind of outer intention on your side. You need knowledge in the process. You need to have not faith, not belief, but to know that it works. And that only happens through trial and error and patience and time. Look at the Wright brothers. They made a flying contraption that what the hell? Like <laughs> we have like however many ton metal contraptions flying through the air all the time now. They said that iron would never float. And now it flies. And what the heck? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, you know, then it becomes commonplace. It's like, that's the other example. He's like, whenever you go in and you, how if, if he's like, if I wanted to tell you how to ride, a, ride, how to fly in a plane, what would you do? Well, you just get on the plane, you sit down, you buckle your seatbelt, you wait for the lady to come and bring you a Diet Coke. And then you watch a movie and then you get to the place that you were going. That's all you have to do to ride in a plane. You don't need to know how to fly it, you know? <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. And that's so much better than faith. And that's what faith, I mean, and I think that's what faith is. So someone says in the chat, I love me some faith though. Me too. I love faith too. I think like real faith is more knowledge than it is belief. In fact, it's pro it probably is, truly is knowledge. Just like we're talking, we're talking semantics now at this point, you know, what is faith versus belief versus knowledge. But, you know, what I'm saying is like ultimate, knowledge in in the process you don't need any confidence you don't need to conjure up any extra energy for anything you just know that it's going to be that way you, you know and that's it's it's a lot of the magical this is the magical chapter this is really about i think how faith is i believe it can happen and the difference is that we don't want to be at that place we want to be at the place where i know it can happen it's already happened so that's that's the difference between like faith and knowing and it's not that faith is a bad thing it's just that faith does <laughs> i mean it doesn't seem like it it's supposed to be like a very good thing but faith isn't always knowing that you'll get what you want it's believing that you can right i think so i mean again i i think at this point you know, we could talk about definitions and probably everybody has different definitions of kind of what faith means. Then. Yeah, yeah, what it means. Yeah. Because I mean, coming up in the church and stuff, I definitely have my own conceptions of it. Um, But I know that what he's talking about in this chapter is really more aligned the, along the lines of knowledge. It's trusting. It's truly trusting the process. It's saying this is a natural law. If I do this, then this will be the result of my doing this. And that's really what it's about. That knowledge itself, once it's embedded, then the process happens so much faster. I mean, it's like mastering anything. And certainly anything that looks easy is fucking so hard. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> everything is so hard. And it's like the easier it looks, the harder it was to, to figure out how to do it. But <clears throat> Once we have that, once we have that awareness, that knowledge, that that process is there. That's why we can walk out into the world and confidently, confidently say that our world takes care of us. You know, we understand that process. We we know 
through direct knowledge experience. Right. As opposed to being like, well, theoretically, based on what I read in this book or, you know, so-and-so said, you know, so I should believe it. you're trying to create, you're trying to trick your mind into believing something. And that just doesn't work. Y your mind it's will believe it if it directly experiences it though. Yeah. Faith with that application is not the same as knowledge. I would say. Yeah. It's, and it's, and it's easier. You, said have, than you have to have the action. You have to have the, you have to move. It's true. And, okay. So one thing I really liked that he talks about in this chapter is that, you know, the idea of branching lifelines, because that's, that's what we're talking about. This whole reality trans surfing, we're talking about, you know, surfing the different waves and finding the right lifelines. Right. But he says that, you know, every, it fractals all the time. Life fractals all the time. Every time you make a decision, there's, there's two choices to be made. Right. And, or sometimes more than that, but we'll just go with two, but there's always a positive and a negative. And you, what determines which one you're going to be on is your attitude toward it. It's like, if you feel like it's a negative choice, then it's going to put you on a negative life path <laughs> and vice versa. And even if you choose the wrong thing and it's negative, but you can find the positive in it, like we were talking about the silver threads, you're still on a positive life track. And you have time too. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think that's another thing too, where it's like, it's so easy for us to get down on ourselves. It's like something happens and we react to it. It's like your initial reaction. You're not stuck with that. You know what I mean? At, yeah. at any point you can be like, oh, well, I, I greatly overreacted. Uh, I'm actually going to celebrate this now because I know this actually brings me closer to the, my goal. I don't know how. And of course you won't. But he talks about that. He talks about celebrating the negative situations and circumstances or the unexpected things like celebrate those too. celebrate it when things didn't go the way that you work wanted them to work out just because that's also bringing you closer to your goal sometimes it's bringing you closer to your goal like well you better dig in and fix this you know this is a problem you know <laughs> And, but like you said, there's no failure, only feedback. You said you wanted this. Now you better do it. Like, yeah, you said you is. wanted there's it. No I've set you on the path to do it. You're not just going to nail that it to me recently. Yeah. You're not yeah. just going to nail it the first fucking time, bro. I'm sorry. Nobody Dude. does that. <laughs> sorry. I had started, you know, making slides for what I wanted for my future and you know, I felt like, oh, but I need to, you know, wait until I'm ready. You know, I need to wait because I'm not quite there yet. And it was like, reality was like, nah, <laughs> you wanted this. So we're forcing you to do it because this is what you, what you chose. And it's still what I choose, but it was like forcing me into uncomfortable situations because I did choose it. So even though I had some really crappy things happen, it, ultimately was for my good and i knew it i knew it as it was happening like i saw what it was doing i saw like how i had created it but i created it because i was trying to put off what i wanted which i what i intended what i made my goal slides for and you know reality is like no you said you wanted it on the you know the easiest track so we're doing it like this like we gave you the opportunity to do it yourself and now we're gonna force it so and throw your hat over the fence and make can't the say signal, I'm sorry. Make the signal happen, and then all of a sudden, the things start to go into motion, and then you can't undo that process once you've started it. So it's you scary. Just go with it. It is very yeah. scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> oh shit! Like okay, but this is what I want. I don't feel like I was ready yet, but yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's, it's that's gotta, it. The chain of events have to unfold the way that they're supposed to unfold in order for me to get it the way I want it. Then I have to deal with it. Yes. Yes. And, and, in doing so you are allowing yourself to have growth is always going to be a little bit uncomfortable, but he talks about how allowing yourself to have is the most important element really for growth. It's like, you have to to be able to allow yourself to have you could money or resources or other things really aren't what is going to help you the most on the path 
it's really allowing yourself, allowing yourself to have and opening up to that. However, however you can literally in any possible way. Yeah. Cause it kind of goes on to the whole, you know, there's some people that are able to go on holiday whenever they want. And then exactly. there's other people who like have to save all their money and do it once a year. And then and, they go um, on vacation and the weather's bad and the ski lift breaks and they don't even get those five days. Yeah. And then the whole time they're worried about the money that they're spending, even though, you know, they budgeted it for the whole time, but, but, you know, and that's why, you know, they really, they allow themselves to have in a, in a sense, but not really like they were probably the whole time more worried about the money and not the experience because if they allowed themselves to have a good experience, it probably would have turned out perfectly and the money wouldn't have ever been an issue. Yeah, it's true. It's, oh man, it's so funny. Yeah. I love this. I mean, and it's true. It's it, it is scary to grow. It not just can be. It's uncomfortable. It's scary. You know, but what's scarier? Like staying the same forever? Probably. Stagnating. I think the idea of that's that's where I was is that the idea of being stagnant is seems like such a waste of this life. when we have so many possibilities and so many things that we can do, like why are we settling? And that's, that's really just where I am. And as far as growth goes, it's in every aspect, like growing my muscles. You think that it's not scary sometimes for me to like, look at myself like, Oh my gosh, like I'm looking crazy, you know, but I like it, but then I don't like it, you know, cause it's just like seeing, seeing the changes is scary a little bit. It really is. Well, I've had to see myself change. So I heard this, I've been listening to this one psychologist talk a lot. And one of the things that he says is that whenever we accomplish a goal, what's great about it is that the goal requires us to become something different in order to attain that goal. You can't, you, we, in our, in our state, whatever it was that we were when we, when we, you know, made the goal, we were not able, whether it's physically, mentally, some other thing, to be able to accomplish that goal, we had to actually change and transform into something else in order to be able to accomplish that goal. And that goes right with the hero's journey. And you yeah. see it all the time in the movies. <clears throat> well, you never get the same results <clears throat> or you never get a new result by doing the same thing. Like <laughs> if you do the same things over and over again, you're never going to get the new results. So you have to, you have to become somebody else. Yeah, you do. And what is that called? And allow yourself to have it. Yeah, but I'm, we're um, stalking. LARPing? <laughs> stalking? <laughs> Back to the caffeinated stuff. Well, no, it's true. I mean, think about it. So think we about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and think about your ideal self, whatever it is that you want to accomplish in this uh, incarnation. He, he goes on at the end of the book to say that there are different goals. You're not, you, you may not have the same goal forever. You may have a goal and then, that goal might you accomplish that and then you change and go to a different goal. But what is, what is that person like that where that is identified with that goal that you currently hold? You know, what does that person do? What, uh, what are the characteristics of that person? Right? Like not to cause identity crisis. You are who you are at your heart, but it's like the more that you can LARP, you know, and, and bring those elements, and the, those personality traits to life that are correspondent to that goal to coordinate yourself with it, the more, the more like I would say natural and more of a flow that you're going to have the transitions. Toward, yeah. yeah. Going toward that goal and changing into that person because the person that's accomplishing that goal and the goal that's being accomplished, those two things have to be the, that's not, you have to be that person in order to do it. You couldn't sit on the couch and eat Doritos and not go to the gym and compete in a bodybuilding competition. Just that's, you can't do that. You have to be the person that you you've created. When that you goal. can, you're going to embarrass yourself though. Cause you're going to be the one with the jiggly ass. Right. And maybe a lot. <laughs> I of just went to a bodybuilding competition on Saturday and I saw a lot of jiggly asses and I was like, I, 
I messaged my coach and I said, do not ever let me on stage if my ass is jiggling. <laughs> Fair enough. Ugh. <laughs> oh, it's bad. <laughs> it gave me a complex a little bit. I was like, does my ass jiggle? <laughs> so bad. That's There's so a lot. <laughs> okay, I totally derailed the conversation. That's okay. But so yeah, okay. so so yeah, so we were just talking about jiggly asses, and I, that actually that gets me off track too. I would not have been disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be like, oh, jiggly ass. My mind what went there. Say? Oh, yeah. oh. This is a bodybuilding show. I realize that women just generally have jiggly asses, and that's okay. But not at a bodybuilding show. Well, I mean, were there snacks? Was there like a crafty table with some, some like some protein spins, bars and stuff? Yeah, bar. I mean, that's cool. I mean, it makes it that makes it you know a little more casual. Oh yeah. It's always good to have a snack. Um <laughs> they uh yeah, this chapter really he talks a lot about the clay golem. He talks about the pendulum and how the pendulum works us too. And he gives some more insight into that, like how the pendulum sort of strings are situated, where it like it'll it'll make you it kind of give you the idea that you're free, but if you go too far, you'll you know, you'll feel the string. It's like the idea of like, oh, I'm just going to do this one last time that you think that's your idea. If you're like having an addiction to something or if you uh, are going to, you know, let's say, I don't know, do whippets. You're like, this is the last time or whatever. It's not your, that's not your idea. That's the pendulum's idea. I'm posing it on you or something. Right. Uh, I don't know why I chose whippets. <laughs> I don't know. I like whippets. I'm gonna go ahead and everybody the or take a. Oh my gosh! Are you gonna take a whippet? Right? Take a whippet on the stream, dude. You know <laughs> that's that'd fine. be fun. Some ready whip in the pantry. Go ahead. So going back to the acting as if though, that is a really good practice, and you know it's a short meditation, really, and and not only meditation. So yeah. When you're becoming the new person, you know, the person that has this job, the person that does, you know, this thing, not only should you visual, I mean, visualize it for sure. What do they look like? What do they feel like? What do they smell like? You know, do all your senses, add it all in there. What do they talk like? You know, what, what words do they use? What lingo do they use? But then go take it a step further. Like, if you want to become it, then dress the part. Like you don't have to do it all the time, but why shouldn't you do it? Sometimes you, you become it. Like that is the art of stocking in a nutshell. It's not only visualizing all the little elements of what you become, but it's also taking the action, right? So that would be like put a costume. If this version of me wears a suit to work, then I better wear a suit. Like, let's do it. Like, what does it feel like to walk in a suit? What does it feel like to wear the dress shoes? Not the same as the guy who wears his sweats all the time. This is a whole different person. This is what this person would be like. So then you're, you're, you're vibrating at that frequency. You're vibrating at that, that energy of that lifeline. And you're putting yourself way closer by becoming, by doing those things. Yeah. Well, I, we can do anything, but we do have to choose, right? Like to choose to means to decide. It means to cut away in the Latin. They say, they say, I, don't, I can't say it, but anyway, it means to cut the root of the word to decide. So really it's cut about the fat. cut everything out that is relevant to your goal, what you're trying to do and focus on the things that are relevant and focus on and do those things because, you know, we, we can't do everything in one life. So you kind of have to make some choices, you know, <laughs> and that's fine. That's part of the fun, right? Like you get to choose and, you know, you choose what feels best and what your heart wants, what your heart came in here for. But there really are a lot of options and they will, the goals will change. You know, you'll have a goal for a while. You'll accomplish that and then you'll get another goal and you'll accomplish that. And it will feel ordinary and mundane to you. And that's, it's kind of sad in a way because you're like, you get all excited because you're like, the thing, I'm going to do the thing. And then it, you get it and you're like, okay, well, now it just feels like my refrigerator that was over there. Just the same. 
now what what's the new thing now what <laughs> exactly so but i want that life that's the life i want i want the life where i always have a now what like like okay we accomplished what's the next thing let's welcome to it you're already there <laughs> because otherwise you're just stagnant yeah you it's may true. as well just have dementia and alzheimer's because you're doing the same shit over and over and over again no you're right you're right yeah i mean that's it's it's definitely better help those neural pathways and you, and you are elevating your balance point you're elevating neutral and it's like the more that you can grow and develop the more that you can share what you've accumulated uh, uh, in the form of lessons in the form of material resources whatever with other people and add to their lives do more for yourself and for them it's like i i don't know I, i've i've always had uh some struggles with the idea of money i think that's embedded into us from a very young age especially in the christian church but when you think about it and i challenge people to think about this it's like if you had resources or do you trust your judgment with them better than black rocks or what you know what i mean like it's just it's a no-brainer you know like i uh i don't know it's not all about having stuff either like don't get me wrong i'm not a materialist by any stretch of the imagination or like a um, it's not stuff it's the experience it's not, a, it's, it's not about stuff but it is yes and it's more about the experience that's the other thing too is like you can accumulate a ton of money and just be miserable every single day like and that's how a lot of people live who do have a lot of money so thinking about that too you know how do you want to spend your time what do you want to be doing what is important to you and uh plan accordingly, create a strategy that is going to allow for that. And I think that's part of it too. When we get into some of these things, now uh, we, you know, create a different reality for ourselves. And then we're like, ah, this isn't as cool as I thought or whatever. It's like, I, I don't know if I were to go back maybe 10 years ago, I was just like, God, if I could just not have to work on the tree farm, I'd do anything. I'd work it from home eight hours a day and make cold calls, anything, whatever it takes. I just want to work from home. And then you get the opportunity to work from home. And you're like, ah, work four hours, you know, and like, fuck off, you know, or whatever. You're like, ah, it sure would be nice to just be skiing all day, you know, or like, whatever, the next thing, whatever, you know, and, and you're, I don't know if it's your, um, but you can easily get tied in to doing something that is pure at an absolute drudgery too, you know, so I, I I don't know. I say all that to say it's 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 amazing to watch yourself grow and be like, wow, I actually I, I was able to work from home and I started a business and I did this thing. That's amazing. And the fact that we want to continue to to grow and to continue to find find new things and new ways to help people, you know, back to the idea of love. It's really about giving what we are to other people and that sacrificial sort of way. Um and i guess you know through through building comfort and through coordinating that's kind of how we can begin to do it um bit by bit bit by bit so he does talk about you know we talked about a little bit like anxiety you know to get rid of anxiety is to act you just just make an action but it talks about fear like how do you get rid of fear How do you get rid of fear, Abby? Create a plan B. Oh. Just, just, it, you don't even have to have like, you don't have to have 20 plan Bs or, you know, like plan A through Z. You just have to have a plan B and it will help you get over fear. Because all the fear is excess potential. You know, guilt is excess potential. Anxiety is excess potential. So these are all things that that require natural law to step in and balance you out. But yeah um how to not desire accept the possibility of defeat and know it's gonna be okay like yeah you intend no. like i'm gonna have it at some point so but if i'm defeated it's gonna be fine like yeah and it will just open up a new way to get to something that's actually even better than what i initially had yeah. in mind you know that's the maybe, other part of maybe it. i was thinking too small i mean I can't tell you how much I've done that where I'm like, I just want to, you know, live in a van over here and living in a van over here would be fine. But 
you know, I could just like get into that. And then I'm like, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> seriously, that's what I'm going to put my energy towards. No, I want more yeah. than that. I just like <laughs> think a little bit bigger. Like, <laughs> but My um, family member actually sold his house and everything and bought a van. And that's what he does. He just like, I mean, lives in different places all over the time, camps out all the time. He's I mean, like happy as hell. The past couple of summers. Because it's not about things. It's about experiences. It is. Because I don't think things will ever really make you happy. It's kind of like the same as money. Like you get the new computer and you're happy with it for a couple of days. And you're like, eh. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> it's not exciting anymore. It's true. Yeah. Like I'll, I'll never forget. Um, my mom always quoted it. Like there was this television you know, this new news broadcaster, um, a reporter was sitting there. She interviews a beach bum and the beach bum was like, she's like, you know, don't you just wish you had a sofa and, you know, little comforts like that? And he goes, heck no. He's like, if I had a sofa, I'd have to be home all day and I got to hang out at the beach. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's about the experience, you know, it's not about things necessarily. Well, we all yeah, want different. Right yeah, I mean, we all want different things, right? And so oh, we all want things. Things are fun. But you yeah, know, but no, I just mean like, fun. but even the experience, right? Like we all want different experiences. And I think it's really more about the experience than anything else. And some people are going to be like tantalized to drive like a super fast car. Other people don't care about that, but they want to jump out of a plane or go down a river or like, you know, go scuba dive or what, like whatever. And so, yeah, that's another thing that you said too, is it's like your credo is not something that you like really work on. You just, you just have it. Like, it's just a natural thing. And like your taste, your personality, that, that those things are, that's you. And you have a very individual, uh, taste for things, a thirst for life, whatever those experiences are if you can figure what those things are out, then you can begin to coordinate those things into your life. And that's when the apples fall to the sky. Like that's the, the kicker. Cause remember the you are a droplet of the ocean. You are God, but you are also unique. You're a unique little droplet. You're your own formation. You're shit. If you went through the whole, water cycle and ended up in alaska or something you'd be a beautiful snowflake that's very individual so yeah that's true just because i have a lot of lookalikes it doesn't mean i'm not extraordinarily <laughs> unique <laughs> even though i look extraordinarily regular okay <clears throat> and that goes for all of us we all have <laughs> unique unique characteristics and traits that are that are us and that that's the cool thing too to like lean into those things find those things what those things are and then it becomes a lot easier to understand yourself and to give yourself the things that that you really do want whatever those are you know, like dig down into that and then you can really use this coordination idea to work through outer intention yes you can by turning over your goal slide and working on working on the little slides in your transfer chain you know you can make anything happen yeah and choose the positive you have brand. To, yeah you have to allow yourself to be worthy like find the your worthiness of it like believe in that don't believe in all the self-confidence is bullshit. It's something you you just have to believe in your own worth and that you're ready to have what you ask for, what you want. Just Yeah, you are uh, worthy to have what it is that you want because you were programmed with the desire to have that. Like, why would, why would God pray to himself? Why would you have the desire if for any other reason than you to do it? Now that takes action. You can't just have the desire... And it happened because that desire has to be turned into intention in order to actually happen. So we're going to use the transurfing model to turn desire into intention. Some people use magic. You can use a magical spell or ritual if you would like. You can rub one out to a sigil or you can make a <laughs> make an altar. There's a million billion th different things that you can do. 
Um, but the transurfing sort of ideology is, is really focused on the experience and the process the whole time as it, um, as you just kind of go through and highlight the positive outcomes, keep what you want in mind. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, figure figure out what you want and then create a slide, connect to it. And, uh, and then act, take steps to the mailbox is what he says, right? Like take a step yeah. to the mail, whatever that is by the web domain, do the, and you don't have to go the whole time. I'm going to the mailbox. I'm going to the mailbox. Like, you don't have to make a production out of it either. You have the intention. You're going to the mailbox. Yeah. It's not a big deal. You're dude. going to the mailbox. Act yeah. like you've been here before. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. That's Did funny. you just freeze? Oh, good. I couldn't tell. All right. Probably. <clears throat> so, yeah. Okay, a couple more of these. What do you do? about how how to increase your worth oh this is so simple and the battle for self-worth that, that's what he said the labyrinth walls will crumble so you don't have to sit there and validate yourself you don't have to and don't ever do it to anyone else do not sit there and prove your worth to anyone or try to convince somebody of your worth yeah you never just have to know it. defend yourself ever you know you can just be you and allow yourself how to get rid of feelings of guilt stop for justifying yourself oh forgive yourself let it go Every, yeah we're all gonna make mistakes like i said that was one of the things in this chapter too that was a great reminder like allow yourself to disrupt the balance from time to time it's not a huge deal if you if you lose a battle with a pendulum okay you just win the next one it's all good. And just but, the battle with the pendulum is always to disrupt its flow, right? So it's not to fight against it. It's to do something totally out of the ordinary. You can play totally, its game. Yeah. And just do or something different. Completely ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, I feel like this is too much dead space here. <laughs> no, no, well, I like it when it gets uncomfortable. It's fun. Oh, do you? Oh, yeah, of course. I feel like I'm not holding up my end here when it does. Oh, no. I just, uh, I, I, I didn't know if you were going to go with the next one, which is how to deal with resentment. In um, Somebody in the chat said that they forget the name of the practice, but there's a Hawaiian tradition with four different phrases added to yourself or loved ones. It's called Ho'opono. It's actually one of my. Or um, for trauma healing, really, you can heal almost any trauma by those four phrases. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. And you just repeat them over and over. Right. I tried to spell that right, but I probably didn't. But yes. So, yeah, that's a good way for self-forgiveness as well. But... And that's um, that's what one thing he talks about too is resentment. Is like sometimes, like how do you, how do you end? How do you deal with resentment? You end the battle and go with the flow. He said, but sometimes if you just feel resentment, you don't have to fight it. You're allowed to be resentful and just move so on. You know, it's, yeah. Sometimes things just have to run their course. You know, it's like you might have an obsession about something or go on a into a rabbit hole unexpectedly and it's like wow why can't i stop myself from looking into this or having a crush on this person or thinking about going to this country all of a sudden i just can't stop and it's like well don't stop yourself just keep going down that road i mean sometimes even we have what might be perceived as negative feelings feelings of inadequacy or frustration in order to make ourselves go down that road and get better. You know, it's like, I don't sit here and watch my comedy and I'm like, Oh, I'm such a genius. Wow. He's so funny. It's like, what can I do better? Uh, and how can I improve? That was terrible. Wow. Really bombed that joke. Maybe I should just never tell that one again. You know what I mean? It's not mm -hmm. a comfortable process and that's okay. But, um, 
but yeah, do those things and go down, go down the road, f- find those feelings and allow them to play out and don't beat yourself up for the way you feel. It's like sometimes you were taken advantage of and it's okay to be upset about that. And obviously we don't want to live in the past or in a place of resentment, but sometimes those feelings and all that excess potential just has to burn off somehow. It's okay. Yeah. Over time, you know, like, like I'm not an advocate for like, for holding in emotion, but sometimes it's just the only thing to do. And like, but what he means by go with the flow. So if you're, let's say you resent your boss, they're an asshole. They're always an asshole. They ask you to do asshole things all the time. Um, I can be resentful as fuck and have, give myself a, a really bad day, or I can just go with the flow and like, not like get me down. Like, Okay, I'm gonna play a little game today. Um, it's a choice. Your attitude is a choice. So that's that would be the way to just go with the flow. But the uh, you know, sometimes you resent people in your life and things, situations in your life, and you feel like you just can't get past it. And that's you will even like just choose that you will eventually. <laughs> you just don't have to do it right now. Yeah, exactly. And that, okay. That's perfectly said. Perfectly said. Yeah. I mean, just accept it. If there's something that you can't change, accept it. Locus of control. You know, what can you control and what can, can you not control? And the things that you cannot control, even though your mind wants to, just learn to let, let go. And the more that we repeat this process, the easier it is for the mind to just understand it like it's on a bike no training wheels. It's like, I don't know how this thing stabilizes itself. I don't know why it's balanced, but we can ride it. So let's go. It doesn't need to no stabilizers. <laughs> it doesn't need to be in the cockpit. It just needs to sit in, in the aisle or by the window in the plane, sit there, watch a movie, and then it'll be in its destination. You know? I oh yeah. That. Yeah, man. Speaking of which, I did a float tank on. You Sunday. did? I did the float there. Yeah, flotation therapy is really cool. Fuck yeah. I love that. You literally like float on the surface of the water and you like have hallucinations the whole time. Kind of like the liminal space before you dream. It's very liminally. So. Yeah, I love doing that. In fact, I'm probably going to make an appointment to go back up there really soon. I used to go a lot with my friend Steve back uh, a little while. There's one about it. 40 minutes from here and I love it. I missed it. It is awesome. I'm glad you did it, Abby. That's great. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Cheney kept talking to me about it. And then I, um, I just happened to be at that place. Like after the bodybuilding show with my son, he wanted to go to a tea bar. I was like, Oh, okay. So big thing. And, and they happened to have flotation therapy. I was like, sign me up doing it. And nice. I will do it again. Yeah, I strongly recommend. It's good. I need to start doing breath work again. I'm going to start doing that. It's like certain things I, I do again. And I'm like, why did I ever stop doing this? This is fucking awesome. Like even reading this book, I know. you know, I really need to read this chapter again because it was so good. There's really so much that we could kind of uncover. There's like a lot of nuancey stuff. Um, but I just, there's just not enough time. This chapter itself is two hours long and I think we're, we do a pretty good job of taking, you know, a decent amount of the information and synthesizing it here. <clears throat> but, um, there's a lot of just cool nuanced stuff in here. And there always is every single time I read these, read this book or the, any of these chapters, like at random sometimes. And some of them I, I read over and over again and we'll, we're getting to one of those pretty soon um as well but yeah uh y'all hit us up and hop in that telegram chat get in that facebook groupies i'm gonna be doing readings again i'm home it's nice to be home big fan of my house and where i live it's great um abby anything coming up with you what's going on yeah i'm gonna plug myself here i am offering lifestyle fitness coaching and with nutrition and i'm also offering life coaching so in addition to bootsy here i'm i'm doing the same thing so if you'd like more information hit me up 
All right. And be sure to tune in to Secret Society of Good Guys on Fridays and Sundays. At midnight. I'll be lurking in the chat, judging all your jokes for this during the live stream. <laughs> Trying to find writers. No. Hey, I told a joke that I heard in like seventh grade and I did a good job. I thought I was going to like kill it. I thought I uh, not kill it in a good way. I thought I was going to ruin it and I pulled it off. I remembered the punchline. You nailed it. What was the joke? Tell us. I nailed it. <laughs> well, it's bad. It's distasteful. So I don't know if it's it's good enough for blue collar mystics or not. Well, it's in like it's distasteful. <laughs> how is it like misogynistic, distasteful, or is it like you know Republican or to or right? Oh, no. Is it political or is it like kind of raunchy? It's raunchy. It's kind of raunchy. Well, we do say the f bomb on here, so yeah, but fuck doesn't really mean anything. It's just kind of a well, it's it a sentence a and <laughs> answer. <laughs> it does exactly. Uh, okay, it's what no, that's smart fine. people say. Right on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, fair enough. I'll have to write a joke for next week. I'll write a joke. And uh, yeah, well, it'll be my first joke that I've written. I will. They're telling. They're. They're. They. They want to hear the joke. They want to hear the joke in the chat. They're. They're begging for it. Send it. They say. Send it. <laughs> Do you know any joke you could just make in the up the chat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know a short one. What do you call a cotton picker? What? Actually, I probably should change what I said. <laughs> a girl who lost done. her string. Oh. <laughs> okay. She's probably okay. who do you call a cotton picker? <laughs> I like it. That's a good joke. That's fun. <clears throat> It's kind of I hope that too. was sati <laughs> satisfactory for you guys in the chat. That was pretty fun. I'd never heard that one before, so I enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, and so we'll end it's there. It's my we'll favorite one to tell in public because you make everyone cringe, and they're like, "Did she really just say that?" <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I think the raunchy, dark, dirty jokes are super fun. They're my favorite, but you know, that doesn't mean it. It you know, it doesn't mean this is the place for it. Let's see. <laughs> right <laughs> but yeah patreon you know what I'm saying? <laughs> there's some stuff happy there. joke hour yeah yeah we're gonna do an <laughs> she hour. attempts to be a comedian it's gonna be fine you're gonna crush you're gonna do just fine um well cool yeah so we did coordination this time the next chapter is uh forward to the past which is a really cool chapter like these later chapters even if you didn't read the book you can still take a lot from this i think but these later chapters are some of the ones that I don't think really get very much attention. It's just such a thick book and all the theories really are the first 10 chapters. And then so the last few chapters here are really a little bit more practical, how to put this stuff into action. So I think it's just going to get tired of theory. We want to do the cool stuff. The we want to shit. Yeah. Yeah. We want to like skip timelines and like, you know, make a uh, clock again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And make things levitate or whatever. And, you know, by the, by these metrics, or at least it's explainable how to do all of that kind of stuff. And we will talk about that. We will talk about some crazy shit coming up in these next chapters. Um, that's not only possible, but people are doing it. People are doing the stuff that Baranikov Institute and, uh, and other places are logging some of this stuff, which is wild. But anyway, it's not really about hocus pocus, witchery, voodoo, magic. It's about just accomplishing it's our goal. It's about the fact that going back to chapter one, that science only explains phenomena in one little sector of the alternative space. Mm -hmm. It doesn't explain how everything works, you know? So that's just what's observable in one area. So, yeah. I don't know what my point was. No, that's like right. That, that's, that any, that's, anything's possible. That's really any, it. Is that anything literally is possible? Everything exists already and anything is possible within that framework. So that's where we're at. So let's do some cool shit because we're all friends here. And uh, we'll talk. We'll keep talking about this next week. Hit me up. I'm doing 
coaching too. I have some spots. I'm just going to start doing single sessions too. I was doing packages for a while and then I've put together so many courses. I got to upload the last one and, uh, and I've got that stuff up. So, you know, if you're trying to work toward your goal, I really feel like that's where I do the best. Like I can, I can really help chart a path to get from A to B. And actually we're going to go from B to A and back to B if you will, because that's just how I like to do it. But yeah, I've got, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, um, a lot of cool and interesting and unique tools as a one of the weirdos in film production for many years. Uh, learned a lot oh, of he does. obscure I did his skills. Yeah, that's right. Get coach program. One of my flagship clients. There we go. <laughs> also, that's right. <clears throat> yeah, like the... But yeah, but yeah, we all are um, doing amazing things. I'm super happy to be able to break this stuff down and to be doing the show. I'm so happy to have Abby on it. Thank you all for being here. Hit us up in the thing. I'll be doing readings again and uh, Telegram and Facebook. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I'm not going on tour again for a little while. <laughs> got a little break. Had a great, had a great time, had the most amazing time. It was such an incredible trip. Sets were good and the company was amazing. I just uh, met a lot of awesome people. The Grimerica show guys were so cool. I got to meet Dave Matheson as well and his presentations, just mind blowing at the, uh, the Eclipse at the Canyon event in Utopia, Texas, not to mention the bands. I put a link in the Telegram chat to the band $50 Dynasty. They're awesome. You got to check them out. And I'm going to put another link to one of the other bands, Henry Invisible, who's like a multi-instrumentalist. He played all the instruments in, on loop on stage. And these guys were incredible. Like they were next level. It was like, it was, I couldn't, I was blown away by the talent there at the, at the, and the comic comics were all hilarious too. So, um, yeah sounds like quite the experience your pictures it was were phenomenal super cool yeah the pictures turned out great we were all worried kind of you know it was one of those days out there where it was like it was cloudy and we're like oh shit are we even gonna see it and we all like came together everybody got in a circle you know and like did their thing and and then the sky cleared just as the eclipse happened <laughs> so it's like right as the eclipse happened the sky cleared and you could just whoop, we saw the full thing in totality Pretty wild. Were you seeing a lot of cloud seeding though around it? I don't know if there were a lot of cloud seeding, but there were a lot of clouds. It was just extra cloudy that day, and it was also stormy. Um, when well, because we had intentional, you know, intentional cloud seeding here. I know they did in Florida too. So I'm like, it's weird. I this is off topic. Uh, but I just noticed it in the chat and I just want to say, I didn't know about this. Uh, a dude talking about how the key to his happiness is ensuring he eats pickles every day. I've been eating pickles every day and I, I'm pretty happy. So I'm just going to throw that out there. I do agree. And uh, I'm a big fan of many different styles of pickle. In fact, not just the dill, but also I like the hot and spicy dill and even the sweet and hot pickles as well. Or even bread and butter. I'll even eat bread and butter. I think pickles might be the key to happiness. That and wearing more hats. <laughs> I don't know about that. I think it's a choice. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, happiness is not outside <laughs> you. And it's not a future event. Okay. It's just deciding. You, you just got to choose to eat I'm pickles. I'm happy, damn it. That's what you got to <laughs> do. I'm going to eat these pickles. All right. Well, cool. Well, again, thanks everybody for being here. Come check us out next week. We're going to tackle the next chapter and I've got all, I've, I've got some stuff to upload and things uh, and I've got some uh, videos and stuff. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, Chaney, that sounds delightful. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll see you guys. <laughs> Sorry. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs> Don't put the hot and spicy ones up there. Okay. Much love. Red ring of fire.